when you were doing Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me wish everyone a happy new year. We're still uh, in the early part of January, so uh, before we know it, we'll be skipping through into Valentine's Day and, and through the rest of the year. So, uh, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Glenn Ruskin. I'm uh, here at the uh, American Chemical Society. I have the pleasure of leading our external affairs and communications group. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our discussion today, Open Science in 2017, Predictions and Guesses. And this is the 226th session of the Science and the Congress program that we began back in 1995. Uh, we are a nationally chartered organization, a not-for-profit with uh, nearly 157,000 uh, chemists and chemical engineers and related professionals. Uh, our members are actively engaged in solving some of the world's most pressing uh, global challenges and uh, one of the leading sources of authoritative scientific information through our chemical abstract service and through our over 50 journals. Uh, today's program is the third in a series of discussion-based br briefings here at ACS. So it's called the Science and the Congress program, but we're trying an experiment and trying to do some of our programming off of the hill. So we have one more uh, after this, and we'll we'll culminate uh, our experiment this month and assess and see uh, how we want to uh, proceed in the future. So today, panelists will discuss their thoughts on um, how any given policy topic might be considered at the national level in this new year, noting the context of both a new incoming administration and the new Congress. Specifically, today's panel will consider open science, including discussion on data sharing, health records, and proprietary information. They will first discuss the topic with our moderator, and then we will turn to take your questions both here at ACS headquarters and via uh, the live stream. Uh, before we start the program, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, before you leave today, we would really appreciate your filling out the questionnaire, which is on the chairs. Uh, it's a evaluation form that we take seriously and try to continually improve our programming. And you can just leave that in on the table out in the hall. And also would ask that you silence your cell phones. So for, the, for those of you watching on live stream, if you uh, wish to ask a question, please post it as a comment uh, in the YouTube video section, and you will need to log on uh, with a Google account to do this. Today's moderator is uh, my good colleague, uh, Joanne Carney. Uh, her biography and those of the speakers is in the packets uh, handed out today. So I will just briefly note that Joanne is the director of the Office of Government Relations at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And prior to joining AAAS, uh, she headed up government relations at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Um, so with that, Joanne, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this briefing, the American Chemical Society briefing on open science. Um, as many of us who follow science are aware, we've had major advancements and, and there have been major changes in the last decade. We've seen just very recently discoveries of gravitational waves and before that the Higgs boson, uh, advances in gene editing, uh, modeling for climate change and weather prediction and advancements in cancer research. And this all relies very heavily on collaboration between scientists among a range of disciplines um, and around the world. Uh, but uh, more importantly, it relies very, very heavily on access to research and to data, um, this subject of our briefing today. Um, this vision of open science is <coughs> to try and take advantage of the wealth of data to not only advance scientific discovery and also to get more value out of our investments. So we're very pleased to have three great speakers who will navigate both the promises and the challenges associated with open science. I will introduce each of them and they will have a, each spend a few minutes uh, providing some remarks before we um, go to a moderated discussion. 
So on my far left is Patricia Brennan. She is the director of the National Library of Medicine. She came to NLM in August of 2016 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she was a professor at the School of Nursing and College of Engineering. Um, in the middle is Matthew Toussaint. He is the vi Senior Vice President of Product and Content Operations for Chemical Abstract Service. Uh, he has the primary responsibility for the entire CAS product and solutions portfolio, as well as building all its databases. Um, and finally is Christopher Cahill. He is a professor of chemistry at George Washington University. He's an expert in solid state and materials chemistry with a particular emphasis in x-ray crystallography. He also maintains a joint appo appointment at GW's Elliott School of International Affairs, of which I am an alum, and where he develops curricula targeting non-technical nuclear policy professionals. So I will open the floor to uh, Pat first. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am a nurse and an industrial engineer and I speak about the phrase open science from the perspective both of open science as a strategy for professionals to interact with each other as well as a philosophy that says we should engage citizens around the world in scientific endeavors. So when I think about bringing the concepts of open science into my role at the National Library of Medicine, I focus on three areas. First of all, who's involved with the open science? And in our work at the National Library of Medicine, we largely support professionals' access to professional literature and professional resources. So we have uh, products such as PubMed and PubMed Central. PubMed Central is a four million full text article database that can be searched and cross-referenced. We also have 26 million references in our PubMed literature database. Second, we have, I, I think about the service we provide to citizens as a, as a co-producer and certainly as a recipient of science. So we make our resources accessible to individuals, sometimes by translating into lay language, sometimes by making it accessible. Second, I think about open science as a way of ensuring that the results of science are readily available. And the National Library of Medicine's primary contribution in this area is in our clinicaltrials.gov resource. And clinicaltrials.gov, beginning actually next week, not only will clinical trials that are funded by NIH and 89 other funding sources around the world be recorded, but the results of those trials as used in FDA drug t reporting as well as by NIH will be available within one year of the, the completion of the study. The results, by, by that I mean a summary table of the findings of the key outcome indicators of each study. Right now we have 235,000 studies in indexed in clinicaltrials.com. Gov. A smaller portion of that will be the ones that are required to produce their data, so they will reveal data. Finally, the National Library of Medicine thinks about open science as a way to accelerate access to an interpretation of data. And this requires that we rethink the information substrate of science, and particularly of health science, complementing our literature databases with access to large-scale data and compute platforms. So the NIH-wide, and in particular the National Library of Medicine, are in the process of devising new cloud-based resources of ensuring the management of privacy and security as we make data an informational resource for science, and also in identifying how to ensure the, the, the discovery and fair use of data. Thank you. Chris? Oh, okay. Well, thanks. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for having me. Um, I um, bring some uh, comments and perspective from that of a, uh, a view from the trenches, I like to call it, as a uh, faculty member. I'm a more senior faculty member at George Washington University, so I'm, uh, I and my colleagues are a little bit more used to some of the traditional metrics for evaluating work products and for what sort of counts as a scientific deliverable. And in the uh, evolution towards open science and towards open access of journals, there's some uh, challenges from our perspective in terms of, um, you know, how do you assign value to um, 
an evolving landscape of sort of evaluative work products. And so um, I'm a little bit uh, a little bit removed from that at my stage of my career, but what I'm more concerned about is in my capacity as a mentor, or not so much concerned, but uh, something that our ears perk up on as we're trying to uh, uh, be a mentor to our junior colleagues and to emerging scientists or even junior scientists, whether they're on the tenure uh, treadmill or not, um, it's still sort of this concept of um, uh, a, a moving target in terms of the types of publications and the types of work products that are getting uh, created and being recognized by a broader community. And um, also, uh, as a bench scientist myself, uh, things that I'm interested in is, of course, the um, uh, robust peer review process. And so as the uh, landscape of publishing begins to change a little bit towards the uh, open access models, things that I keep an eye on is the robustness uh, of the uh, peer review process that the journal enterprises and journal infrastructures do a, uh, a good job of. And a, yet a third hat that I wear is on the uh, past president of the American Crystallographic Association, and only a few years ago we launched our own journal. And uh, that journal, we came out of the gate as an open access journal, uh, which decidedly uh, has bypass some of the channel the challenges that a uh, that existing uh, um, subscription journals would have but nonetheless I these are sort of the framework that I'm interested in as a burgeoning publisher as a more senior faculty member and also as a mentor to uh, folks that are trying to navigate this uh, dynamic landscape thank you Chris and Matt so um, welcome to uh, the ACS um, chemical abstract service is uh, my organization uh, and uh, it's also called CAS or CAS. Uh, it has uh, about a 110 year history, so it's, it's been involved in collecting information about the science of chemistry and all of the related sciences uh, to chemistry for 110 years. Uh, about uh, 35 years ago, it began really getting into online information and maybe 10 or 15 years ago became really the leading tool in, in using uh, information in chemistry research. Uh, and that tool is called SciFinder. The, my role has been uh, to help design some of those tools and, and initiatives. I think, importantly, we see uh, chemistry and, and uh, information in the chemical sciences continuing to evolve. And in fact, moving towards, rather than people that are doing research looking for references or articles or patents, uh, looking for solutions, uh, looking for things to improve their workflow, uh, looking for uh, ultimately decision support environments and cognitive tools if those are, are possible in the future. So that's the landscape of, of where we are heading. Uh, certainly we've collected information about published information uh, for many, many years. There's a, uh, the CAS registry number, really well known uh, as an identifier of chemical substances. There's some 150 million chemical substances that have been identified by CAS since 1965. And we have about 95 million uh, chemical reactions in the database. So there's it's a, a large collection moving from a collection of information to more of a solutions provider, workflow initiatives, decision support and cognitive initiatives. Thank you very much. So we're now going to move to a moderated discussion and we'll follow that with questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to kick off and I've heard, you know, there's been a lot of different terminologies out there. There's public access to research, open access to research, there's big data, and now we have open science. Um, now you've all touched on this a little bit, but could you extrapolate a little bit more about what what open science really means to you, um, wh what it should mean to us as a community, and do you think there's a benefit to having a collaborative definition? Or I, or I guess a collective definition, I should say. Who would like to go first? Well, so I'll, I'll gladly okay. go first. I, I think um, I, it, it may, uh, the definition I think is evolving. Uh, as the terminology has as well, uh, it, it appears now to have evolved from what I would call open access, which is more in a publishing realm, and largely publishing what I would call journal articles or other information of that uh, sort, uh, to maybe migrating more towards 
uh, data and information collected during the research process that is available. That now is, is becoming more of an open science environment and possibly also the public relationship of that uh, data collection with uh, compute capabilities. So it's, it is an evolving uh, terminology. Uh, I think it's, it still remains to be uh, quite uh, interesting, but somewhat uh, controversial uh, from the perspective of career, from the perspective of proprietary information, certainly companies and, and uh, environments that uh, need to protect their information would be interested in looking at that, but but may not contribute to it. So I think it's it's uh, it it is apparently a public open science. It may not be a uh, an open science in the sense of all science being open. Mm -hmm. I think of open science as primarily and fundamentally a philosophy. That has it underlying that underlies a continuum of accessibility of participation in the scientific process from the very beginning. What questions should be asked? How do we phrase questions? What should be funded? To the results of science being accessible and knowable. And I, I agree with Matt's sense that there there are many reasons why one moves along that continuum, and there's many consequences to them. We have some very well entrenched models of of publishing of career assessment of, frankly, of assuring the public that the science is of a certain quality. And as we move into more of an open science framework, we now introduce such things as public dialogue on the value of a question or public interpretation and reinterpretation of the information. Often when we think of open science from the health science perspective, we think uh, in terms of professionals or of lay people, and we sometimes leave out industry. And yet industry has quite a bit to gain from a model of openness of information and data, particularly rapidly open information that would allow for accelerating of new products overlying existing work or work data on data collected once being reused many times. Thanks. Oh, uh, little to add um, uh, on top of these uh, comments, but other than just to maybe make the observation that a number of the uh, term, a bit of the terminology that you used, Joanne, was sort of nested or almost hierarchical, right. and open science being the top uh, level term, um, and some of those nested uh, uh, terms uh, within probably mean different things to different communities and different stakeholders, right? The bench chemist is thinking different from differently than the uh, uh, taxpayer that wants to have access to a uh, journal article without having to pay the journal subscription fees. So um, I'll just sort of make the broad uh, comment then that, uh, and to echo on some of these pr previous sentiments, it's evolving. Um, and uh, I think given the diversity of stakeholders in, in, engaged in this uh, environment, that uh, it's going to continue to evolve for some time. And that, uh, you know, I'll just leave it at that. So this this notion, I mean, you, you've all articulated, I think, the, the the landscape pretty well. But there's, you know, somewhat of a lack of a better term, maybe somewhat of an infrastructure that's associated mm -hmm. with this as well. I mean, there's a certain, uh, there are a lot of different approaches, whether it's the open access versus public access, the gold versus green. Um, you talk, you know, there's federally funded versus privately funded research or different types of databases. Right. How, you know, do you? Do you think that that the that our infrastructure is set up appropriately? Right. I mean, where do you see some of the gaps, and you know, how can we best safeguard it? I and mean, how do we best set standards and and the taxonomy that's going to be necessarily? And how can we make sure that it is reusable, not only between disciplines to allow science itself to progress, but between public and private, and between the, the you know, federally funded versus or, or public general public access. Well, let me begin by saying Matt indicated <laughs> it's a little the, too big of a question the, there. <laughs> well, I want to start off with the issue about do we have the infrastructure? And, right. and I'm sorry, it wasn't Matt. You, your journalist, which of you has started an open access journal? Oh, we, I did, you have. Yeah, okay, I'm yeah, sorry. I apologize yeah, yeah. Uh, for misattributing that. Um, but existing the existing communications, professional communications infrastructure of publication and of uh, publication through um, private publishers is well established and, right. and is unlikely to change in, in the next 
18 months or two years. But at the same time, we do see the growth of new venues mm -hmm. for publication, new journals that, that don't begin with the premise that there is a proprietary relationship between the publisher and the, the reader. And I think that um, the National Library has been very pleased with the relationship we've had with our publishing community around public access. The public access uh, uh, requirements at NIH are well over a decade old. We use the venue, we use an infrastructure created specifically for public access, that is PubMed Central, that has, um, uh, that allows for deposit of the article of reference. One of the aspects that we believe is quite important in a federal oversight of public access is ensuring that the archival authoritative source of an article be accessible and remain accessible and open. And I think this is actually where we're going to see a lot of conversation coming in the next few years between who actually owns the authoritative version of an article. So I, I, I guess in terms of the infrastructure that is necessary to support open science, I think I, I would describe the current infrastructure as primordial. It's, it's, uh, it's virtually non-existing, but it, it is a long way from what would be necessary to really be effective. Uh, one of the main components that I would say is uh, lacking is a coherence. Coherence meaning the relationship between the entities being carried across various platforms and environments so that you can relatively easily find something in one place and another and their relationships are, are maintained. And today, those sorts of uh, agreements and uh, relationships among parties uh, all the way down to uh, among data are non-existent. The models don't really exist. There are individual models, but they're they're pretty, uh, uh, you know, built up around single entities and and not really uh, well integrated. So I would say there's a long way to go uh, in terms of uh, uh, effective open science. Uh, and not having duplication or extracting real value. Uh, and and that's, that would just be to take what is currently available openly and create something that is interrelated and coherent. So I'll just add, you know, two um, parallels there. Uh, to those comments that, you know, uh, as a new faculty member is taking the, uh, setting their lab up and getting their first papers out the door, they're very much dependent on the sort of existing infrastructure of the peer review process, meaning what the journals have set up uh, to get the remarks back. Then those, uh, in some respects, that review process is paralleled by uh, uh, funding agencies. And there's a, there's a, um, uh, there's a known quantity here in terms of how the operation works, and uh, and there's value in it. You don't always like the reviews you get back, but <laughs> at least you can uh, like to think you can trust the process. Um, when we've launched our own open access journals, we've had to work really hard to sort of rebuild that. Um, uh, or not rebuild, but make sure there was a robust peer review process and infrastructure that perhaps uh, might be transparent to folks that aren't in this business. But uh, really, if you look at the uh, infrastructure of the peer review process that's led by the publishers at present, of which ACS is one of them, um, it's really a significant entity. And uh, to try to rebuild that on an open access side of things uh, is indeed a challenge. So I, some, although our own journal notwithstanding, <laughs> I'm uh, more worried about uh, uh, the robustness then of the uh, peer review process going forward, and is it serving the uh, scientists as well as it should? And I don't have any objection to sort of public comment on my work. I mean, as soon as I get a paper out, I throw it on Facebook and then uh, <laughs> see what people have to say, but it's usually my high school friends saying, what do you do? Uh, but my, uh, um, I, I, if you, <laughs> there's also the phrase you say to yourself when you're reading something on the internet, you're saying just don't read the comments, don't read the comments, don't because it just anything quickly spirals out of control. And is that the kind of discourse you want for scientific results? This kind of public, um, I don't, I have no objection to a public discourse, but uh, a primordial infrastructure that doesn't allow for uh, a kind of poor choice of words, but adult conversation and informed conversation on uh, on the subject matter. So this primordial infrastructure to get us to that next level of talking about things uh, openly 
is something that uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the evolution of. I'd like to make a plea for considering the human infrastructure that's needed to adequately benefit from a knowledge base that's built under open science principles as compared to our more traditional strategies. We need to look at the science literacy conversations that begin as early as grammar school to help students understand probabilities, to help them understand uncertainties, to be um, able to consume information as an adult. Um, and, in, and those require conversations over many years. Built into our educational system are many, many assumptions about the authoritative source, about the, uh, the, the non-biasness and acceptability of peer review, which we all know have been called into question. And now we need to help our young people as we move into adulthood understand that, that science is about exploration and has inherent uncertainties in it which are good to understand rather than should be smoothed over. Well, that is a perfect segue because my next question was actually going to be related to STEM workforce, but you've kind of broadened it, I think, into a much larger point of view. But, but to kind of bring it back to the STEM workforce, do we really, you know, are we training the, our next sci the scientists and engineers to be able to, to harness, um, you know, this notion of open science and, and the availability of such a wealth of information that is out there and what, what needs to be done to the extent that you, you all have been looking at this. Um, and maybe, you know, uh, maybe there are others in the audience that can speak to this as well. But um, I'd, I'd be curious, like, what do you see in terms of the, you know, kind of data experts or, or a, a future role, um, in, you know, changes in the workforce that help kind of help complement, you know, the, the traditional scientists and engineers that we, we currently tend to churn out? Any, any thoughts on that? Go ahead. Well, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I just sort of mentally took stock of my current um, uh, five or six PhD students back at, at GW, and these guys are very savvy at getting information. Um, uh, you know, I, I can remember when I was in their shoes of walking across campus to the library and photocopying a bunch of abstracts, reading them, deciding which paper you then wanted to go photocopy. These guys are um, not only obviously the technology has evolved, uh, but these uh, generation has sort of evolved with it and harnesses it much more effectively than I do. Um, and they're not shy about going out and uh, digging for uh, information and using a uh, uh, Chem abstracts or sci finder to its fullest. These are things that I don't always do. But my point there is, is that I think the mindset is there for people to be hungry, and they're not they're not intimidated by data of this scale or an infrastructure of this scale. Um, but nonetheless, uh, what we still need to be mindful of is to be teaching the rigor and the robustness and the critical and the peer uh, review, uh, all of those other components of science that uh, uh, you, we have. Once you have the data, or once you have some information in front of you, how do you maintain a commitment to critical thinking and um, you know doing the other the facets of science on top of all of that uh, well so I think that um, there's a little bit of a difference between stem education and the public being informed by science right. so I certainly that you, the public being informed by science will enable some stem education and I think that's a great thing uh, there's uh, informing the public is an important aspect of science, but it's not the most important aspect of science, in, in my view. I would say the most important aspect of science is to evolve it, to advance it, to uh, make new discoveries. Those kinds of things, uh, I, you know, generally speaking, the public's input to new discoveries is not that significant. And I think that the uh, scientists working together effectively, and that would include the, the peer review process, is one of the ways that science actually advances. Uh, I think that the public's involvement is important, and their understanding of science is, is key to appreciating what is happening with science and how that's affecting their lives. But I think from my perspective, its uh, scientific advancement is, is probably the, the key element, and information about science is somewhat of a secondary element. Although I would say, I'm sorry. No. Go ahead. No, I was, I was thinking kind of more on your point, because there are efforts or even legislation to kind of promote citizen science, and there are already kind of, you know, uh, efforts and apps that you can contribute. Um, you know, earthquake, and, you know, there's an earthquake in your area, or things yeah. of that sort. Yeah. So I think there is, there are, 
I think an interest of harnessing this notion of open science to get citizens involved in being a part of it, whether they're considered, you know, STEM trained individuals. So I don't know the, the promise or perils associated with that. Well, I, I'd like to see the world be better STEM trained, actually. Um, but I, let me go back to Matt's comment from it because I, I actually very much agree that we are scientists and society, if you will, supports scientists to discover. And, and we, there, that is something that requires extensive training, requires reflective thought, requires creativity. And that cannot be simply um, turned over to, to crowdsourcing. There's, there's aspects of science. Um, in, in nursing, we have a phrase that if, if, if caring was enough, everybody could be a nurse. And I would say <laughs> if, if thinking is enough, then everybody could be a scientist. And we know there's principles, there's knowledge, there's frameworks. Now, having said that, we, the infrastructure has shifted us from picking up a volume of or an issue of a journal and paging through and seeing how the editor has thoughtfully sequenced articles or put several articles together or, or read, written an editorial around a certain theme. And now we have our students diving in to the valley of Google and finding the one and not realizing that next to that, in front of that or behind it, in the very same issue, might have been a contrarian article, might have been an elaboration article. So I believe we do have to uh, work with our young students and work with our, frankly, our, our science policy writers and with our colleagues to recognize that finding an article now means something very different than even five years ago when you might have found it through a reflective search. Serendipity is almost missing. This is disturbing to me very much as we try to, to bring new perspectives in, and yet precision is winning. Now, I have to say very honestly, we cannot sacrifice creativity for precision. And so I think we want to be looking as we build the infrastructure for open science, as we think of, of ways to preserve those kinds of serendipitous discovery. I completely agree the use of standards terminologies that allow people right. to target an area or to collect a set of articles that are relevant is important, but it also reflects a worldview that may not be the only worldview that is relevant. Right, that's very true. Um, so shifting a little bit, um, you, you all spoke a little bit about scholarly <laughs> publishing and uh, protecting proprietary interests. Um, so how do we balance both this, this notion of openness in order to advance scientific discovery while we're also protecting confidenti confidentiality and privacy? And, and what do you see as the challenges of with this growth of digital data, not even just scientific data, but just online information and, and you know, is privacy, especially in your field and, and you know, NIH funded research, you know, is privacy dead? Well, Google knows where you all are right at this moment. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, I don't have a comment on that one. I, privacy is not dead. Okay. Privacy is a discretionary right of an individual to control access to their information, and it, it is not dead. What is lacking is the technological infrastructure to ensure that privacy guidance is actually feasible in any given circumstance. And part of that requires an anticipation of how identity could be inadvertently disclosed. So in healthcare in particular, you've all gone to a clinic that has required you to sign a form or you've gotten a HIPAA handout and you think, okay, my data is private here, it's safe. And in fact, it probably is for the most part. But we didn't take it into consideration. I mean, HIPAA came in 1996. There were no iPhones in 1996. There was no cloud in 1996. And so now we're in a circumstance where the technological infrastructure has shifted. And, and yet the development of privacy-based research has not kept up with the needs for it. So the National Science Foundation, DOE, our, the National Institutes of Health, all have had agendas within privacy preserving computing infrastructures, privacy preserving, and analysis strategies. But there's a long way to go for that. What we have to remember is privacy is not just a lock and key putting your data behind a door. It is actually a, a concept that must be worked into analysis, database integration, and, uh, and the ability of our scientists to think about the potential disclosure, inadvertent disclosure of identity, and to work to mitigate that. 
And what about from a proprietary? You so, have, I mean, there's huge uh, yeah, industries gonna, associated right. so with So I would say, you know, from a proprietary perspective, it's it's maybe a somewhat different situation. And but I think maybe defining proprietary might be a, a useful exercise mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a minute. Um, and and so let's say let's say a professor at GW who's working on uh, solid state materials, and and the information that they've developed through their research. Uh, is is that information proprietarily theirs, or is the publication that they put in open access? Well, that that's an open access publication. But what about the rest of the information that they've collected? Isn't that their information? I think there's some questions about that. I think uh, certainly researchers might say, "Well, uh, I want to interpret my own data." And, and so I'm not necessarily interested in, in putting that out in the open because someone else's interpretation of it may enable them to take my next idea and um, neutralize it. So it's, it, it's, it's personal and it's proprietary to that person. I think you can take that, that situation and amplify that to the corporate view. Mm -hmm. And the, from the corporate view, there certainly are uh, uh, firms that are associated with creating things that, that touch human lives uh, in, in many ways. And, and some of those firms may be uh, pharmaceutical companies or, or other or food and beverage companies. And, and there are reporting requirements and they, they must disclose that information. But, but certainly other areas of, of science will create things that are not disclosed. They remain wholly proprietary. And it, it's a secret how that, how that is done. And, and I think that, that those two ideas about the individual and the individual's information that they've created maybe in their research and the organization uh, affirm what they are allowed to keep to themselves, I think are, are important aspects. And I think as, as there's somewhat of a, a, a breakdown in, I would say, the walls of, of information, it's difficult to know exactly where, where to draw those lines. And has what about the aspect of patent reform? The, the, the new shift from from you know first to discover now to first to file is that is that going to help or hinder this? Well, it certainly helps the first filer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but uh, I think that uh, the U.S. is uh, changing that direction. I think to maybe more of the world standard is uh, something that is ongoing. I think it's it may uh, ultimately create a number of uh, issues that have to be resolved by the patent office and by uh, litigation. And I think, in fact, some of those things are going on now with some fairly famous cases. But uh, I think that's, there's, there's difficulties in that and, and uh, making those things available and disclosing them. People's, what people hold within their, their mind, within their head, is, uh, and when they transfer to another area, another unit, uh, how, that, how that's affected, I think those are all Important questions. Okay. I'll just add a, a tiny bit to this. Um, you know, there's there's also a continuum in all of this as to uh, as to the extent of disclosure and uh, privacy with one's data. Um, you know, I come from a crystallographic uh, community, and we have a long history of sharing our data. In fact, uh, the latest version of the software we use to solve crystal structures and refine them shoves the uh, data as an appendage to the um, uh, file that you will submit to the journal. So we sort of are uh, full disclosure. Um, uh, type of community. Now that also there's a continuum within that. Um, my latest um, lanthanide carboxylate uh, isn't going to cure cancer, but um, the protein community may have developed something that's going to cure cancer. So uh, there's a continuum even within a community that has a long history of uh, openness and sharing, and it's arguably been the ones that have led the way on a number of uh, uh, database uh, commitments and infrastructures. But then when you get to that interface, um, you have to reevaluate. And as the landscape evolves, that has to evolve as well. Good point. Good point. Okay, so I'm going to uh, shift again because um, this is is going to be a question, uh, I guess, at, uh, at some point, um, especially coming from an organization that is scholar has scholarly publishing. Um, so some people may kind of view open science as as maybe confused, you know, meaning for free. 
and, and maybe in some cases it does. Um, but so how do we, and you talked a little bit about that, um, uh, Pat, about you know, balancing scholarly publishing, whether it's not for profit or for profit, um, and this whole notion of various notions of openness. Is there, uh, there is no one model, I, I guess. Open it's science answer, is not but, free. I mean, right. period. Science is not free. Science is expensive. Uh, yeah. It's personnel, it's, it's, uh, it's materials, it's knowledge. Um, and, and the idea of open science as, um, as held as a social value is really quite different than the practical realities of making journal articles accessible after one year, which is the current oh, NIH sure. uh, policy. Um, and where I, where I think that we need to have dialogue with non-scientists is around the issue of what it was society investing in. And to the extent we were willing to, for a very long time, invest in public education. That's wavering a little bit now. And I would believe that um, if we think of lifelong learning and we think of individuals learning over time, then we have to look at what is the societal investment in that. I think there are arguments, and I would be interested in my colleagues' response to this, of whether or not openness accelerates in innovation. And often the, uh, the idea of open science is, is argued from an economic perspective, saying, well, if the data are open, then, uh, then the protein uh, community can jump on top of a chemical and, and get to a, a cure for cancer. Is that really true? I, it, I don't have the quantitative data to make such an assessment. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a State Department person. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it, is it plausible? Are we selling yeah. society something that... Well, sure. I mean, I, 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 I could think of crowdsourcing data, for yeah. sure. If you want to make a uh, prediction about, model something on a global or nationwide scale where you've gotten folks to enter stuff from their iPhones all around the world, I can see that having a contribution right away. Um, that's probably easier to see. Um, behind the scenes, though, um, for... Um, it's probably a little less tangible for a scientist leading a more rigorous uh, study that might require a deeper dive besides holding up your iPhone to get some data. So um, I could see it happening. Uh, it may not happen. I can see there being obstacles to it. Uh, I would love to know, maybe some uh, listeners or viewers or those in the audience would have some comments where you can point to an example, a direct cause and effect, so we can maybe have a dialogue around that. Well. I, so on the innovation issue, I do think that uh, idea sharing does lead to innovation. And in fact, by looking at the uh, work of others, you certainly are, your eyes are opened to what you might do in other directions. But that tends to be, I would say, uh, more uh, coherent uh, and, and that would, rather than just data sharing. Mm -hmm. Data sharing uh, doesn't currently, uh, without some other initiative, lead to direct innovation at the moment that I'm aware of. Okay. So we are now going to shift to the opportunity to open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, as Glenn mentioned at the beginning, I'd like to remind those that are watching the live stream that you need to log in with a Google account and post your question as a comment under the YouTube video, but you must have it use a Google account to do that. Uh, but I would like to open the floor. Um, and there should be individuals with a microphone. Oh, no, there aren't a microphone, I believe. Um, so we, we hope to capture. Right here. Excuse me. Sir, does this microphone uh, work? <laughs> Technical. Uh, if we just have them pass from here and then have you repeat the question. Okay, that's sure, true. Sure. If you want to just stand and, stay, and I'll try to repeat yes, the question. Sure. So uh, my name is Billy Leiserf, and um, I was a, a former Tavoya of Science and Technology Policy Fellow. And my question, I want to first thank all of you on your efforts to make things open, to make, uh, make science open and accessible, and knowable. Um, one of the problems that I saw a lot during the two years that I was in the federal government was access for scientists within the government to have to get journal articles or whatever. And the NLM, for example, making NIH having their policy about if it's funded by this, that's great, but that doesn't cover everything. Right. And it doesn't cover the last year, the new stuff. Presently. Presently, yes. Um, so I wonder if any of you see a solution to that problem. These are sometimes scientists who are embedded in, say, the Justice Department or in some other place where there are not a lot of scientists. And Maybe as a librarian, you might have ideas about how you can structure such, you know, given our 
private public nexus of the publishing community, how you could grant them or grant the whole government access to the information that they need to make scientific discussion. So I'm curious to hear from all of you. But okay, so d let me just repeat the question quickly: Is um, the the challenges of being a, a scientist or, or someone within the federal government having access to scientific information that may be in other agencies? And what are the solutions uh, to kind of build those, that kind of in infrastructure or intra-government um, ability? But even from a journal perspective, too, I mean, in government not having access to their own journal or a journal that's published their studies in. Yeah. Yes, exactly. There, for example, there were science officers, program officers, who could not get access to the articles that were published, that were published. with that money from that. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. They're I, I, I snark first. I don't have any ideas, but just to sort of uh, re-emphasize that uh, when we were up for uh, renewals with, um, I won't say the agency, but you'll be able to figure it out, I guess. We have to <laughs> attach PDFs of all of our publications just to make sure our program officers uh, can get them. But um, I, I agree it's a challenge. I, I don't have a solution. Um, although uh, the other hat I'm wearing as a publisher uh, with, through the American Crystallographic Society and the American Institute of uh, Physics Publishing, an open access journal, that goes away. Right. So uh, we have the extremes in this conversation. Um, may I make uh, two brief comments on this? Uh, there are sectors of the health science and biomedical science research community who are exploring preprints as a strategy for both early conversation about an article uh, or about a, a publication, usually they're written in article length, as well as, as providing access during the time period uh, that a, a publication is pending. Uh, the journal editors, and particularly the journal editors that we work with are in the process of a conversation about does posting your manuscript on a preprint server constitute prior publication that would interfere, interfere with publication? And that decision varies by, by journal, to be quite honest. Um, and remember, I'm talking here about editors, not the publishers of the journals, which brings in a, a different conversation. Um, but I think close conversation with the, with the publishing community uh, must go on, and is going on, I assume, in, in other sectors. It's, it's also going on. The, um, the public access policies that, that have just been finalized across all federal agencies should take us a little bit farther with that. That just came out yesterday or the day right, before. Yesterday. And um, and so I think there, there's, a, there's a little bit of motion, but it's, it's nothing is going to address your last year issue, as you brought up, um, at this present time. Uh, the second, uh, we get the same question from physicians in, in community hospitals who can't get access to a journal. They found the citation in Medline or in PubMed that tells exactly how to take care of their patient, and then they can't get to the journal because it's a subscription journal and they don't have the, the and so there, there, there have been a, some attempts um, across the, the uh, NIH to address this issue during times of crisis. So for example, during the Ebola crisis, there was a, a rapid access to early publication. But it's, all, it's taken as, as the exotic right now. Um, I would return to the scientific community the need to push the dialogue because it has both financial implications for many of our societies who do well with their journals, as well as for the publishers themselves. Um, but uh, there, there is, uh, there, there does need to be, and there is a shifting of what constitutes a publication. It used to be just that final article. Now there's lots of things posting on a blog post, for example, or a wiki, or something website. sitting in GitHub. Russ? So I have a quick comment and a question about intellectual property issues. So with regard to intellectual property, particularly of faculty members, uh, there were a series of laws that were passed throughout the 1980s uh, by Dole and Peterson Weiser being the most uh, well known the modifications to those up until 1989 that encouraged uh, faculty universities and nonprofits and small businesses to hold intellectual property rights, particularly patents, uh, from federally funded research. Now, there's some literature that, that reflects that the number of uh, patents and, and licensed patents have increased as a result of that, those laws. Now, I don't know if that's a chicken and egg thing because it was more in, in, in enthusiasm to patent, and therefore there were more patents, more licenses or if in fact it was a more productive way to market the innovation through the person that was most knowledgeable, the inventing professor, their graduate student. So, uh, so there is some literature on that. Um, 
the raw data does could lead to a patent that's not published in the journal. And so there is a problem uh, that you have. The question that I have about intellectual property refers not so much to the invention per se, uh, but, the, but the comments that were made earlier regarding intellectual property of the editors of the journal, but also the database providers. So that the, in the beginning, we talked about the taxonomy that uh, CAS has, with, with, for example, the registry numbers, but that's not the only taxonomy that, that's part of the database. There are known fields that, are, that, are, that, are, that have certain information in it that, that uh, facilitate a search. Uh, uh, CAS is probably one of the most prominent databases of this type. Uh, the pat uh, patent uh, office databases are probably another because they have a number of fields with known uh, professionally curated uh, taxonomies. But even then, when you have a professionally curated database, the search engine is an important way to find things. So for example, it's much easier to find patents using a professional subscription database like Lexis or CAS than it is to go to the patent office website, which is a pain to use. It's very inefficient. So just some comments on how um, how this open science, open access sort of concept can be facilitated when there's a certain, when there's a huge amount of effort that's put in by the editors and publishers, and also by the database providers, database creators, etc., to really facilitate those uh, those searches that are valuable. So how the question is how uh, how do we uh, balance we, the intellectual property, the actual editors and the curators and, and creators of databases, kind of sweat of the brow. I suppose to a certain extent, as well as the intellectual property of the editors themselves, um, uh, and how can we uh, protect intellectual property in that context? Um, well, did this, I, how, much, how, how can you encourage the database providers to provide a good search engine? For free, but uh, <laughs> okay, so how do we yeah. encourage <laughs> those? <laughs> how do we encourage them to, to to provide their databases for free, even though they've been they've, they've contributed? May I um, may I comment on this? It, this comes very close to the. If, if I understood the, the, this your question correctly, this is near and dear to our heart at this very moment at uh, the NCBI. Um, the question, as I understood it, was databases alone are not necessarily easy to locate, that having a well-curated database, that makes it easy to locate data, excuse me, having a well-curated database and a really effective search engine is really where the power comes in, and that is an intellectual product. Now, uh, the example I'll, I'll call your attention to, and you're all welcome to visit this, is our clinicaltrials.gov, which is uh, a place where indi individual scientists uh, ha must individually upload their own uh, uh, declaration of a clinical trial and their data. So we want to minimize the number of, of fields that the scientist has to provide for us, right? So we can't, and we and we cannot control the terminologies that they use. And so we have, we, we're, we're trying to, to facilitate ease of entry. Ease of entry for 225,000 scientists leads to a very difficult database to search. So you may have seen recently in the post, there was a story of a person just wanting to find a clinical trial for bladder cancer, and we had 1,132 trials returned to that person because there, he didn't know there was a checkbox that would say only active trials 100 miles from Washington, D.C. So, so what has happened, and we're, the strategy we've taken, which isn't going to be very satisfying to you, I'm afraid, the strategy we've taken is the database is as well curated as we can make modulo what an inv investigator is willing to put in, how much resources we have in our budget. But we make an API available so that special interest groups or local areas can actually wrap around our database. So breastcancer.com uh, actually uses the clinicaltrials.gov database, but has their own search engine curated to, or sorry, targeted to the community that they work with. Um, an institution, for example, in Boston might want to only extract uh, cl uh, clinical trials that are occurring in, in their hospital, so they privilege those trials first for accrual. They may put, wrap a different front end around our database. So it's a conversation, if you will, a communication between the search engine provider and the database structure. So I, I guess on the uh, the value side, I, my um, I, I maybe also make a little bit of a comment on the intellectual property side. But on the on the value side, I think it returns to a statement that we've said earlier, and that is that science isn't free. And how, whoever organizes the information, however they happen to do it, it's going to take an investment. And the more you're able to derive from that information collection, 
the the greater the investment is more li more than likely going to be. So it's 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 not easy work. It does involve uh, investments in both algorithms and and human uh, effort, and it has to be updated and sustained. So I think it, it's there isn't any there isn't a free lunch other than here today, <laughs> and uh, that that's that's part of the process I I think around science that if if you want to advance it it has it requires investment. Um, I, I think on the intellectual property side. Uh, from the university, and I think it was a, a little bit of an earlier comment about some legislation in the 80s and what that might have enabled in terms of uh, things like universities, like uh, the Wharf. The Wharf uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, it's, yeah. it's probably the most uh, enabling component of the Wisconsin University environment, uh, all based on Warfarin primarily of, of years ago. But but those all of those licensing abilities around university employees creating intellectual property, I think it, it there has been a real movement in that direction, not only in this country, but uh, worldwide. So uh, CAS also covers uh, patents from Europe uh, and Asia and the largest uh, patenting body in the world today is the Chinese Patent Office. Last year, they dwarfed the size of the American Patent Office, the US Patent Office, in terms of publications of more than triple the number of uh, applications published in China. And a very large portion of those, uh, it, my recollection is about 30% are associated with universities in China. So there's a strong degree of encouragement to have university professors in China filing patent applications from their science and, in fact, monetizing that, that scientific discovery into an intellectual property that can subsequently be licensed, not only in China, but uh, in the United States or, or other places. So in terms of our competitiveness as a nation, I think it's, it's pretty important that we have some level of inventiveness that is allowed to be sustained in professors, so that they can they can do things like like file patent applications from their discoveries. Any other questions? Yes. We haven't talked a whole a whole lot today yet about openness and the piece of the scientific process of going from shared data to just replicating someone's results with the existing data, um, such as shared scripts or, or workflows, and I'm just curious to know um, sort of what the state of that is in, in your respective fields. Okay, so the question was the, the, the difference between just shared data versus uh, data in order that would allow other scientists to replicate or reproduce information, so methodology, um, uh, you know, and other information that would allow um, that reproducibility to occur, and what advancements that are you seeing? Uh, well, I, I have a very limited response on this uh, from a very limited set of experiences, which is the crystallographic community, which has always shared its data. Um, the movement now is to, and, and by the way, uh, you can reproduce somebody's results from their data, meaning that reproduce their interpretation um, as a consequence fairly straightforwardly. That's been capable for some time. Where there's an added layer, though, is um, in the crystallographic community, you have the raw image files from all of your diffraction experiments. And uh, the community is now beginning to uh, see the potential, well, they've seen the potential for some time, but to recognize the infrastructural needs and capabilities to do just that. So to share raw image files and then let somebody come in and process them right from the processing to generate the usable data that then goes into your algorithms and your structure solution and stuff. Um, what happens sort of automatically today is that post-processing sharing. But there are arguments that could be made that someone processed something differently, a difference in their methodology. So uh, the crystallographic community is involving in that regard, but it's evolving on top of a fairly mature uh, um, uh, culture, besides just infrastructure, culture of, uh, of doing that. And maybe my colleagues can say something about some other communities. So the, the NIH is very uh, committed to reproducibility of, res of results. Um, uh, the phrase uh, rigor and reproducibility, I think, appears on every letterhead now in our, in our system. Um, and, and yet, um, there, it's well known that it's really quite difficult to, to reproduce 
an exact experiment, particularly when we have human subjects involved. There are many uh, features, facets of, of how, of even how the individual's everyday life who participated in the study that might make it very difficult to reproduce results. There have been um, several uh, 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 reports recently about reproducing um, uh, bodies of work from certain areas. Cancer is a, is a, a large one that's been I'm sorry, I'm searching for the name that was, it's being released this week. Um, and, the, and what's come through is a couple of things. One of them is it's, it's very difficult to, re, to recruit or accrue enough people in a clinical trial. So we don't necessarily want to re, reproduce all clinical trials because some of them weren't good enough, so we should move into new ones. Um, a second, uh, a second uh, consideration is um, with the prime, re reproducing the primary outcome measures because they do change over time, what's considered an appropriate stopping point. Um, we do have many journals in the health sciences now that require submission of a protocol, a fairly detailed protocol with the manuscript or prior to even considering the manuscript. Some journals will only review a manuscript if the protocol itself has been reviewed. So you have to have an approved protocol registered with that journal before you can, um, before you can submit an article. And there was question about whether or not the protocol submission needed to be made public. And in many, many journals, it is, it is public, but not in all journals. Uh, we have also heard, however, that there's very little use of those protocols. So once submitted, they're not downloaded very often. And um, they really depend on the individual investigator. You could argue, again, that's an, a, a law of numbers. It's just too many. So one for every study is not, maybe not so bad. But in fact, if we're going to address reproducibility, particularly methodological and workflow reproducibility, we have to market it differently. It can't be serendipitously discovered, oh, I found this article, let me back into the, to the workflow. But we have to think about how we index workflows and methodologies in a way that even if you're not asking that specific question, that methodology may also be of use to you. Thank you. So I, I think it's, there's a continuum, and the continuum starts uh, in biology and moves to physics and maybe slightly beyond into mathematics. So if you're somewhere in the middle of that continuum, it's probably important. I think chemistry, the edges of chemistry are on both sides of that continuum. So that the center of chemistry is, is highly reproducible information. And, and maybe as you approach things that are more biological, it's quite, it's quite a bit more difficult. I, I think that it's important that, that science be reproducible. And, and I think that, that there may be elements of an open science environment that can help reproducibility on that biolo biology side of the equation. I'm not really sure that it's going to help reproducibility in the more physical components of science that we cover. And I'd, I'd also like to add, even though I'm, I'm simply serving as a moderator, I'm not speaking on behalf of, of, of AAAS and the Journal of Science, but I do know that um, representatives from the science family of journals uh, for over two years now have been uh, holding a series of workshops with other scholarly publishers, federal agency representatives, and scientists on this issue of reproducibility and, and holding workshops on specific disciplines to kind of address, to tackle some of these issues. What do we? What, what are the problems associated with with achieving reproducibility and replicabil repl replicability? Um, and um, you know, what are the standards? What do we need to know in order to kind of you know protect the, those disciplines and allow the science I, to progress? Can I add two comments sure. on that? Um, one is that this question again is bigger than right. this scientific yeah. community. Right. It deals quite a bit with the, the way we value innovativeness in in the academy overall. Uh, and even in, in, in NIH protocols now, NIH grants are often evaluated in terms of their innovativeness, which means not being reprodu not reproducing, but actually going to something new. So we have to address that issue. A scientist who's, whose strength is in reproducibility isn't discovering something novel or new unless they can refute previous results, I guess. Um, the, the second part is, uh, to me, that is really quite critical here, is that as we think about um, reproducibility, we need to, to, to understand the goal of it. Is the goal to, for, to maintain scientific integrity? Is the goal to enhance uh, validity? And I, and I don't think we're always clear when we talk about the need for reproducibility what it should be. Not speaking against reproducibility, but speaking from the perspective that we need to know why. Is it that we need to be sure our results are more trustable, mm -hmm. that we have greater confidence in them, or is it some other d dynamic that we're unaware right. of? Exactly. Good point. Any other questions? Yes. So, what's your opinion of the 
potential for adverse effects or the risks of open science, if any? I mean, there is the clinical trial that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's risk with all all science. So it's just as science is in free science is not risk free. Um, remember that that our interpretations are often probabilistic, and so there always is a chance, even in the the, the most precise study, that there's a one percent chance it could actually have been uh, the results could have occurred for other reasons. Um, I'm most concerned about two issues with the with the risk of open science. One is 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 in in some ways. Um, uh, transitioning our concept of what stimulates innovation. If we don't do that well enough, if we don't help people see, I, have, I agree with what Matt said that I think openness enhances innovation. But if we don't, if we don't convey that we're at risk of losing innovation because we, we haven't helped people understand that the openness is a pathway to innovation. Um, and the second is, is premature interpretations. So that um, uh, we, we've all seen some very massive and I, quite honestly quite frightening failures of medications so where the drug trial didn't go long enough or there was not enough, uh, there, the endpoints came in too narrowly. And um, some of those came from published papers that were accepted and, um, and others, uh, uh, and, that, and that has been frankly used as an argument for open science to force the trials to have to report all their endpoints. But interpreting science and interpreting a probabilistic result is not something that people intuitively do. So I would worry that uh, showing that we've seen, we saw two people out of four have a reduction in a tumor size because we applied a particular agent would lead people to either say, yay, this is really working, or my gosh, it only worked half the time, when in fact it was only four cases. So, so helping people understand numeracy and scientific literacy is, is, is critical to making sure that open science doesn't lead to bad outcomes. I, you know, I would amplify that a little bit, and I think that I, I really agree on those points, and I think there's another adverse effect of potential excessive openness, and that is that advantages that you might be able to create from a persistence of closedness are going to be lost. So there's, you might say, well, what, a, what possible advantage might that be? And there, there may be some. And, and certainly your interpretation of your own information and, and letting that take its course, you might be able to advance it more than just a group of individuals that is evaluating it. So I, I think it's yet to be seen what the disadvantages are of open science, but clearly that wasn't the initial uh, approach that human, being, human beings took. They didn't uh, immediately lay open everything that they had. They, they chose to interpret it and, and create things that were then uh, discoverable by others. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that we know all of the implications yet. Little to add other than the, the, your question was sufficiently broad, perhaps on purpose, uh, with a nod. Uh, you know, I, I think this, it, it's going to mean the potential risks uh, or adverse effects are different to the different stakeholders. But I think one theme that has sort of become dominant, or at least uh, if not dominant, uh, uh, recognizable in today's discussion is the variety of stakeholders in uh, the entirety of open scientists, from the researcher to the consumer to the uh, uh, innovator to the attorney to the whatever. And um, as a consequence, I think there's going to be different risks at different stages of all of those things. And um, and I'll just sort of echo Pat's comment that uh, I think we're, we're entering a new era of um, responsibility of the citizen <laughs> uh, to be uh, capable of processing uh, this this data. And that's a that's a heavy lift. Uh, your average person doesn't do too, <laughs> here's a, your average person doesn't do too well with probabilities. Uh, <laughs> uh, not a, no pun intended. So my point is, is that uh, my I worry about these things as an educator. I teach freshman chemistry, 120 people each semester, and I'm nervous as I'll get up um, to make sure that folks are thinking critically and doing just that, not thinking it was a dynamite study because it worked half the time. Uh, so, uh, um, these are things that, uh, if you would want to consider that a risk, yes, but I wouldn't call it an adverse effect. I'd call it a challenge to the community to uh, up our game in terms of getting people to think critically. 
Pat? We've been referring to risks almost exclusively at the end point of the science, but I want to go back to what was what was pointed out earlier. We could have we spoke about open science as meaning lots of different things. So openness about protocols, for example, might be helpful to a person trying to choose whether or not to go into a clinical trial. But it may be overwhelming mm. to open some of our protocols to a lay person because their fund of knowledge isn't great enough to interpret that. So we have to consider what yeah. openness at what point in the scientific process and what what constitutes openness? Simply exposing a protocol to a naive person about the test of two or three different chemotherapy agents doesn't really make it understandable to them. It does make it open. So if, if we have to think about openness and the risk of, of frankly, really opening without assistance is probably there. I hadn't thought of that before. So and you had mentioned before about uh, communicating also to the general public. I mean, yeah. do you see that the federal agencies or, do, or or even a role for group, you know, nonprofit organizations like ACS or AAAS kind of expanding a role and being a science communicator to kind of serve that purpose? So you you want me to put in a, a plea for the broader impact section of the NSF grants sure. right now? <laughs> sure. We don't have that at NIH, by the way. Um, <laughs> Would you want that? So do I want that? You know, I actually, but, well, another story, I'm a fan of broader impacts, but I think they have to be well written. Um, I, uh, um, this, to me, we were speaking of intellectual property earlier, and, and what a scientist brings to an experiment is the, the, the knowledge to design and interpret. And, and so to, I, don't, I think those people who can design and interpret aren't always the best communicators. Right. Now, I come from a tradition in Wisconsin where outreach was really important, and where every, every team had to have its science communication or its outreach person in place. And, and I'm telling you, a good journalist, a good outreach specialist, does wonders for a team and helping others understand what that team is doing. Um, I, I believe very strongly that scientists have a responsibility to ensure their work is accessible. I'm not sure they're always the right person to make it accessible. Good, good way of putting it. Russ, again? Uh, with regard to this last comment, uh, just you like the broader impact section? I do. I, I, I used to work at National Science Foundation as a board officer. I'm quite familiar with the broader impact section. I must say, I've also been a reviewer on the merit review panels, and, and I have to say a lot of the panel members are not very familiar with what broader impacts are. Right. Somebody somebody put something at the end of a at the end of the proposal to sort of get that ticket punch, and the rest, of it, at least in the, the situation I'm referring to, the other uh, panelists said, "Well, you know, check it up, whatever, just check the box." And, and I don't think I think that that's what this is a good proposal from a great proposal. You know, I agree. Is always going to be probably pretty good. With regard to your comment about journalists, Joanne and I went to a seminar some years ago in, in Switzerland where most of the moderators on a, on a scientific mm -hmm. panel were in fact journalists. Mm -hmm. Those who are who oh, are who are responsible for communicating in a to the general to the general public. Uh, a sort of a comment or question, I'm not quite sure what it is, with regard to the general public and the open science aspect. Uh, one might say that the openness of the science on a website or what have you gives the, the general public, the lay person, access to the information. But I don't know, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, that the lay person has the capability to distinguish the wheat from the chaff. And so, for example, I was at a party some time ago where I had a climate change argument with a climate change denier, and his justification was that he saw a YouTube video from somebody with a PhD articulating why climate change really wasn't Real. And so, and so, how how do you you publish all this stuff on the website? How do you make a distinction on what's good and bad? I don't think most people uh, who don't apply to NSF are even talking about broader impact. Right. Frankly, I will say that NSF is a, has a movement now. They're under a lot of uh, uh, scrutiny, let's say, in, in uh, and, and but it's a good thing. Uh, one response that they have is that they are publishing um, uh, summary abstracts of their of their research. In plain English, and the program officers have the have the uh, authority, whatever word you want to use, to re-edit those to be in plain English. Uh, in a way, I think that's a great step in that direction. To sort of, you know, I don't know how many people want to NSF's website to read the public abstracts, but that's a way to start to at least get the community thinking about how to communicate to the public. It's a requirement of the grant, and it'll be re-edited re by the program officer. I don't know how many of them are uh, communicate or not. Right. But anyway, so any comments on how how that can sort of the good 
open science can be distinguished from bad science. Okay, so there's right, two. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the question, just to repeat the question. So, for the layperson, for the general citizen, uh, you know, open science allows them access to really rigorous scientific information, but it also opens windows for them to access information that is less than rigorous and maybe completely mis you know misinformed science. Um, agencies like NSF are are kind of taking a, a the. the um, requiring that uh, abstracts of proposals are written in a, in a layman's term. The abstracts of the results are written in, in layman's terms so that individuals can read the, the results in, in simple language. Is that one way or what other ways can we do to try and ensure that citizens have access to rigorous information? There is a, a, a quasi-federal agency called PCORI, which is a, a, a the Patient Outcomes Research Institute, and they actually have made a, a commitment to to devising lay abstracts from scientific abstracts to make uh, sci health sciences more known to the public. I, I, to be very honest, I'm of two minds with this. Uh, I don't want to Google Translate for lay people, so I don't want someone to take a scientific abstract and just run it through a translator and say, okay, now lay people understand it. As a scientist, I want to be sure the concepts that I'm trying to convey in those words are communicated, not necessarily the words. And we've learned that that requires a conversation, that sometimes the way a, a lay abstract can read for a study uh, is less precise than a scientist would, would, would require, or perhaps um, potentially um, uh, devaluing is not the the best word, but 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 de, it, but it uh, conveys that the work is less complex than it truly is. So we we have to have an interaction, and and I this is where I, I'm actually quite a fan of having professional communicators help us communicate science. Right. right. But there's also a body of evidence that shows there's social science research that shows that even having access to layman terms and understanding complex scientific information, whether it's nuclear power or nuclear weapons or climate change, doesn't necessarily sway your opinion. You may, you still hold other beliefs, um, your own, your, whether it's political beliefs or ethical and moral beliefs, at a, to a higher level, even Actually, if there was, you accept. There was a rebound in the vaccine mm -hmm. literature that if you if you taught people about that vaccines right. don't cause autism, they became stronger in right. their belief that they did. Precisely. So, yeah. <laughs> Now it's just no this. guarantee. <laughs> Any other? Well, well, let me try this. A new, new person. Go ahead. Just picking up on your your umbrella title, science and Congress. That the uh, interest in Congress has shown primarily in this in this uh, issue going back about twenty years now has been the availability of of data underlying scientific uh, work and methodologies and so on, uh, where that work was either conducted or funded by the federal government or federal agency is going to rely on it in some kind of regulatory or you know, some, some outcome that has some legal effect. And I think there are you know, a lot of concerns that the government has been rather slow and reluctant to comply with these sort of mandates. There are arguments that, well, that's because the people who want this stuff have bad motives. What are your thoughts on, on those issues? So the question is that from a policy perspective, there are some members of Congress that are are trying to, there have been differing efforts to ensure that there's access and transparency of scientific information that's used in setting policies and especially in regulations. Um, and the view that agencies may kind of work to slow down that process because they, they don't, they, they don't think that the mem you know, policymakers have their best interests at heart, I guess is the best way to, is that a fair, okay. Um, not necessarily in your Actually, this is, bucket, again, near and dear to our heart in clinicaltrials.gov, because the first legislation requiring open reporting of the results of clinicaltrials.gov happened in the late 90s. And the final rule of the reporting happened uh, September 14th so of this year. So, so that's almost 20 years. And, and it was fairly straightforward. The results of any trial submitted to the FDA and evidence of a, a performance of a therapeutic need to be publicly accessible. So of course, it was a technical challenge to build a platform and to create the interface that was acceptable to people. But it, it did take quite a bit of time. And some of it was following, finalizing the regulatory side of it. And some of it was developing the technical side of it. 
um, my, but the big, the bigger issue that I think you're addressing is um, how do you, how does one actually show that the data are available? And, and I don't think there's a good, uh, if you will, science around that yet. So people are trying different things. In clinicaltrials.gov, we have a, a self-report of a trial. We we actually don't go back and say was this trial a good idea or a bad idea. We have the self-report of the results. It's not peer reviewed. There, we, we we review them for consistency and accuracy. But that's different than an archival journal. Um, in, in other cases, though, the idea of demonstrating accessibility of the data for that finding might mean just extracting a subset of a data and attaching it to an, an article you described. And we now have that, we will have that capability in PubMed Central to attach a data file to a, a published article. But it might only be a small slice of what the full trial was. So understanding what's the boundary, how do we index it, where does it come from, I think are, remain still unanswered questions. But there's fledgling, primordial attempts, I guess. <laughs> the aspirations always outpace the, uh, yeah. the infrastructure. Right. Right. You know, I, I think that uh, in in the case of human trials and clinical trials and things of that nature that involve healthcare and physicians trying to make local decisions and things of that nature, it does seem pretty rational that that, that information would be reasonably widely available. And, and I'm not sure exactly who you might be referring to in terms of the wrong people getting a hold of something. But but the public can be informed in different ways and, and unfortunately doesn't always make the right decisions. I think when you go towards scientific discovery, real scientific discovery, I feel a little bit differently about that. I don't feel that that is in the same realm of uh, citizenry needing to understand the data behind scientific discoveries that may be more physical science or basic science. I, I, I understand the, the healthcare side of things and that that may relate to some individual's actual health status. But it's, uh, and I, I certainly appreciate uh, uh, global warming or climate change, those kinds of things, uh, hopefully being something that people begin to understand through more uh, better maybe uh, journalism or public science uh, disclosures. But other things that, that might relate to maybe more basic science, I'm not really sure what the value of making that available is to the public. So if, if you happen to come up with a new reaction that creates a new set of small molecules that do something special and it isn't cure cancer, okay, uh, why is that going to be disclosed openly, even though possibly it, some of that was funded? So I mean all of the data. I understand that maybe the published article would be made available. That's, that's understandable. But why everything? Why an open science environment in that realm? It, I, I don't see the advantage to, to human beings or, for that matter, to this country. Okay. Any other? Yes, sir. So I have not a question, but an answer. You have posed, the panel has posed innovation from open science, right? And do you have any example? It's a hard question to answer in terms of there's even arguments about whether the tech boom has increased the pace of innovation and productivity, and economists argue about that. You can't do the experiment. The experimentalists <laughs> can't do the, well, what Can't take it away. Right. But I will say that in research, I think there's no question in my mind that it has. I mean, there are lots of databases, curated databases. I worked on fruit flies, fly base. There's a whole combination. This is funded by NIH, uh, largely to, um, to hire people to curate all the information, go through the literature, and put it together in a highly effective database, which used to be in a book. Okay. It's not anymore. <laughs> no, exactly. So the genome project, right? right? So putting all of that stuff out there, I think that someone who you know is more talented than I could look at that and look at the innovations that came out of that. So just so that we didn't leave the impression, maybe that there oh, was, no. you know, does right. anyone know? Um, that there are certainly good hypotheses. Certainly, information sharing leads to innovation. I, I don't disagree in any regard. But it's, it's how it's shared and what form, whether it's curated accurately, whether it's reliable. I think all of those things are changing since the Drosophila genome was done. And, and Billy, I think if I'm understanding your comment correctly, you're also viewing the database as a product of that in innovation, not necessarily what came next from that. Correct. Yeah. I think both. 
Thank you. I think uh, that was a great closing comment. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the end of our time here. Um, and I appreciate that. I think that was nice. I kind of ended on the promise uh, of, of, of the future of open science. Um, so we'd like to thank all of our speakers today. If you'd like to join me in thanking them. And for those of you here in the audience and for those watching live stream, um, if you want to look for more programming in this policy discussion series, there will be a whole series later this month. Uh, you will receive an invitation for this and future ACS Science in the Congress uh, project briefings. Um, and if you would like to be on their mailing list, you can send an email to uh, science underscore congress at ACS dot O-R-G. Um, so I thank you again, and I'm sure, uh, well, some of the speakers may be willing to chat a little longer if their time allows. Thank you. Well done, colleagues. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.